I'd like to start by introducing myself. I am you get to create things that make people's life easier. I'm a software engineer, which is a bit of a background in electronics. My specialty when I studied engineering was which translated to English goes like software engineering, but is something slightly different. It's applying software to software. So you get to study things like compilation, operating systems, um, IDEs, uh, all kinds of things that are relevant. As I'm growing, I found new interests. Uh, I think philosophy is essential. You see that as philosophy and an outlook of life. Um, I developed new interests. Uh, chamber music, Bach, and we have Archicode. And combination so um to the point and um, combinatorial algorithm it all comes from here electoral magazine is that tackles to electronics enthusiasts so of all sorts and uh, at the end of every issue they have a puzzle called exodon Exadoku is a function of the regular Sudoku problem, which you're probably all familiar with, except that it's not a 3 by 3 problem, but a 16 by 16, a uh, 4 by 4 problem. So you end up with a grid like this one. Um, so you have the grid. Uh, Every spot in the grid is an hexadecimal digit, 0 to F. Uh, the rules apply. The rules of Sudoku apply. They're simply extended. So uh, you, every digit has to be unique in uh, a sub-quadrant, a 4x4 four four quadrant, an horizontal row, or a vertical column. Um, when I see a problem like this, I tend to think there's no point in wasting time solving this manually. Why, why send a, a human when, uh, for a machine's job, as they say in the metrics? So, uh, I thought it was more interesting to spend some time figuring out uh, automatically. That kind of problem uh, can be solved uh, by resorting to recursion easily. Um, in essence, you know, you, what you would do is um, find out a spot that is unknown and resolved and uh, explore the alternatives given the constraint defined by by the rules of the game. Um, so here we could start with um, this spot. And um, given the rules of the game, uh, we know that this spot cannot be any of those digits or any of those or any that are in this subquadrant. So um, the way the algorithm works is, is not by looking for a solution. It's by uh, filtering um, unviable alternatives. In essence, uh, we, I implemented this, this, the, the solver 
as a, a simple thing. Um, it's that I think of the problem in three di dimensions. The two geometric dimensions and a third one, which is um, a bitmap. In essence, um, if a spot is resolved, that value in, in the, uh, the grid array is a uh, power of, two of that digit. So here, the only bit that would be set would be bits 14. Uh, here, the only bit that would be set is bit uh, 2. The solver works by um, iterating between two phases. Instance, which means um, essentially um, search space reduction. Um, as I mentioned it um, previously, we use bit masks. Uh, for instance, here we know that this spot can be any of those digits or any of those digits, or any of those. So this reduces progressively the, the bit mask for this particular spot to something that is viable. Um, so I'm going to show you some code. You take this. This is the solver. So, as I mentioned, inference is just elimination of alternatives. Now, once you're done with uh, uh, inference, once you cannot progress and reduce the number of nodes, you have to speculate. Uh, speculate means you, you select an unresolved spot, and you're going to explore the possibilities for the spot. Um, among the possibilities here, um, we will do recursive scores. So the trick here is that um, it's a recursive algorithm, but the grid itself is implemented as a global variable. Um, we maintain state. Uh, a very important state is the recursion level. Here it's uh, it's noted as RL. Uh, it's incremented an entry, decremented an exit, and we look only for one solution, so we don't have to maintain the recursion level when once we found a solution. This algorithm assumes that there's only one solution, and we stop at the first one we find. So here we go over the grid. We look for a cell that has more than one bit set, and uh, we, um, we make sure that um, there is one, <laughs> for starters. If there isn't any problem solved, otherwise, um, yeah, we stack up the, the cell address and the original uh, bit mask value. <coughs> the bit mask is the sum of possibilities for that particular location. Um, it's very important in this, for this algorithm to work that this stack combination, the currently unresolved cell and the original bit mask value is preserved. It's central. <laughs> um, so we explore the possibility for the unresolved star, uh, uh, spot. Um, as the grid is a global variable, and this is a recursive algorithm, I do not make a copy of the grid for each recursive call. Instead, I maintain my, what I call a transaction stack. Uh, a transaction stack um, keeps track of... Um, the original grid spot states for each spot that is modified. 
So it starts with um, with a speculation spot. This defines a transaction boundary. And later on, every inferred change is going to be stacked on the transaction stack. Yeah, there's a, a bit of um, visualization here, underline, visualization, minus underline, blah, blah, blah. So instead, once we, we're here, we recurse. We have made a speculative choice. What if this choice was valid? Would it lead to a viable solution somewhere down the line? So it's very simple. Speculate using the spot and calls itself recursively, assuming that one speculation choice is valid. Uh, there are two alternatives. Um, inferences leads to a contradiction, a violation of constraint somewhere down the line. We stop, we backtrack. Backtracking means you take all the changes that have been queued to the transaction stack and you play them backwards. You undo stuff. Right, so it's a bit of a database rollback um, if, if recursion returns true, it means we, we found a viable solution, we stop. First solution found is the, the only one. We don't have to stop. We could, we could continue and, and check if the, the problem has multiple solutions. But yeah, I'll stop at the first one. Um, yeah. After a few days, I, I, I figured out an algorithm to do this properly. But it was not satisfying because um, zeros started appearing in the grid. And if you have a zero, it means there's no solution to this problem. So I, I worked on a version two of the algorithm. And uh, this is where uh, things uh, went wrong. Introduced the of the in the solver, um, and uh, that that returns back of the flow and something really nasty. So um, the solver itself is uh, 650 lines long. Heavily documented, of course, but um, yeah, I, I mean, debugging is, is not easy, despite what people say that Fortis is the debugger. Um, if you're debugging something recursive, um, it doesn't make it any easier. Um, so, um, traditional debugging techniques. When you're debugging, it's all about methodology. If you don't have a method, you're not going to make it. Enforcing assertions, I think it's just essential. We tend not to do that systematically, but it should be done. Um, a good logging system is essential. Often it is overlooked, but I think it's, it should be built in from, from the start. Um, you could use, um, I call it a debug vector, and, and it could be a bit mask or a number, and, but it, it's essential. Then the next step is um, code review, introspection of the code, or um, better documentation. Um, my documentation was pretty good already, but um, yeah. Documentation code reviews, you don't always have someone available for a code review. Uh, I do my code reviews myself <laughs> because um, nobody else will do it for me. Um, and then you have the ultimate tool, which is you develop your own tool to debug the problem that, that presents itself. So the problem, after I implemented the serious logging system, 
uh, we can see what the problem is. Um, the problem happens at recursion level 16. Uh, at recursion level 16, you have um, 32 items stacked on the data stack. So we, we see here that at recursion level 15, the cell at uh, row 4, column 1, is set to 5. Once it's set to 5, no recursive call can change that cell in theory. Uh, we do inferences, nothing can be inferred from, from that speculation. Uh, recursive call, one change, we cannot infer anything. One more recursive call, we can infer. Um, yeah, the speculation call at recursion level 16 changes that cell. We can infer a few things. We have a constraint violation here. We backtrack. Speculation, we exit from recursion level 15, backtrack. And here, the cell that was owned at recursion level 15 is changed at recursion level 16, which is a serious problem. That, that is a bug. That is the bug that I, I tried to fix. So the only way this can happen is if the data stack is corrupted somehow. So the, 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 the whole point of this talk is to introduce a, a tool and technology I developed to um, ensure that to detect when the data stack content is modified. And I do this by uh, applying a uh, a message digest algorithm to the data stack. Because the stack is deep. Uh, like I told you, at recursion level 16, you have 32 items in the stack. I don't care what they are, but what I do care about is that the content is preserved, not changed. So, that stack digests. Um, it is a shorthand to represents the content of the data stack, regardless of it or anything. Um, any message like it would do. Um, Ulrich said uh, that um, a CRC would work, I agree. I went through uh, SHA-1. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. You, you, I, 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 I get on. The primitive that this tool is based on technology is S Digest. S Digest prints a digest of the data stacks and it omits you. That's that's all there is. Because you look like yes, it's it's a number. Okay. I I. I U is at the top because when when this is this is a visual tool. No 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 that's fine. Then that, completely fine. It is it is essential that you can skip when you print the digest. This just prints the digest. All right. Um, I skip a number of cells at the top because I want to be able to print the digest knowing that the cold function I want to instrument uh, returns to the value. They're all critical, as, as you saw, uh, infer if, recurs if. So I want to skip the top cell when I think about it, because I know I'm going to have to 
and that flag will be there. That that's all there is to it. So once you have this and you're debugging the solver, you get to uh, traces like this, which are extremely useful. You can see the digest here. The stack is not changed after the call to infer. Here it's fine as well. But here we have a problem. The digest is different. So the bug is in the infer code, obviously. And in, in effect, this is more of the solver code, which is um, because I think if I publish it, it takes longer to enter the data than the solver to produce the result. So, yeah, using using those message digests and, and, and here detecting the, the data stack change, I was able to converge on, on the error, which was an extra two drop in, in this primitive here, reduced all by So, I think this is a, a useful method for detecting unwarranted data tax changes. Um, the current of this information is um, public domain. The storage code is not. Um, recursion is awesome. You can do things using recursion that would be very difficult to do otherwise. Um, I think I came to love recursion when I started studying list. In list, uh, you have there's no other way. Um, performance. I'm a bit of a better performance. performance. Yep, you don't really have to care about performance. But I'm also into retro computing. So the solver was developed on the G4. But it was not the target platform. The target platform is actually a 6309 platform I built, I designed myself. And um, I can run the same code under G4 and under my system, which is why I love standards. Why I went for SHA-1, it's so well specified. Uh, um, the performance work I did on this is ongoing um, through a complex problem requiring uh, 6900 backtracks. I started at uh, 4 hours and 38 minutes on my 8-bit system. I'm down to 2 hours and 30 minutes and I think I can still go down by better managing locality. Um, I'm doing this in a global fashion and, and I'm, I'm convinced it's not the right way to do it. Um, it might seem like a, an exercise in futility, but I, I love it. Performance matters on old systems and um, that's it. <laughs> Uh, there are other options. Recently, I, I, I um, realized that the solver could possibly be used as a generator. Uh, and that, that is interesting, but it uncovers uh, other bugs in the code. Um, you could conceivably start with a grid and uh, a few defined spots, powers of two, and run the solver, and it will eventually figure out a solution. It could also figure out if there are more than one solution. So it could be used as a problem generator, and that's, that's very cool, and I'll keep on working on that. Um, questions? It's 
something I introduced. Uh, it's an extra two drop, which corrupted the stack. <laughs> uh, when I uh, worked on um, I mean, elimination of zeros appearing in the grid. Uh, that alone, the elimination of zeros, it's 15, 10 to 15% performance gained. That's significant. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I can't make any promises uh, with respect to the future. We could, and it was suggested, I, I had this in mind as well, uh, I could have built-in instrumentation to prevent that from happening. That is, um, those signatures, those digests, sorry, instead of printing them, I could stack them and uh, and force and forced to the um, the stack uh, invariants automatically. Yeah, I could do that. This is a brute force attacker, and the whole algorithm is. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, this is this would be the rational way of handling it. Um, uh, this is not the way I uh, handle it. <laughs> uh, my versioning system for this was a local copy with the version numbers suffix. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I'm full of contradictions, and um, I resort to methodology when I have no other choice. <laughs> Who knows? Yes, after I had I developed all this stuff, I found out that uh, there was a, a C algorithm and a system Verilog solution published on opencores.org. I looked at the C code, I didn't like it that much. It was not, it was not as elegant as my solution, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, be it as it may. Bill? The, on, the only invariance I, I, I was targeting here is the data stack contents. That's the only thing. It's not a, a this is a, an ad hoc solution for a specific thing. It's not generic. It's not a be all and end all to um or's logic problematic. <laughs> it's uh, this is an engineering presentation, not a scientific thing that aims at world peace or anything like that. Yes, I have a demo live over there. And I will show you uh, the G4 solution in less than a second, and um, the 8-bit solution on the real hardware in a few minutes. I have the schematics as well. Yeah, yeah, everything is public domain. The firmware, well, everything except the solver. But if, if uh, the general Understanding is that uh, publishing the code is not a problem, then I will publish the code. Well,
No. No. Well, you, you can always find a maximum for it. The maximum recursion depth will be the, the number of unknowns, for sure. The, the real problem, the real problem is not the return stack, it's the transaction stack, the number of inferred changes, and that is difficult to predict. No, 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 no. It's a dedicated stack, and uh, each entry is actually two cells. It has, it maintains the transaction, the limiter, the boundary, um, and and for each change, it has um, the coordinates x, x, y, and and the original bit mask. I have a um, thousand twenty-four. Uh, cells allocated for the transaction stack, and I haven't overflown it ever, even on super complex problems. Uh, changes from unknown to unknowns are also logged on the transaction stack, in my case. It would be hugely impacted. Uh, um, one, one thing I, I didn't mention is that uh, it's a, I use a um, greedy algorithm which means that when it comes to selecting um, an unresolved spot, I always look for the weakest point in the grid. That is the, the uh, spot that has the least number of bit set, but more than one, obviously. And uh, this is a, a factor of 8 to 10 in performance. The, the greedy aspect of the algorithm is super important. The return stack is, is not really, yeah, it's used. Yeah, of course it's used. Um, in my implementation, uh, return addresses on the 8-bit platform, return addresses don't go to the return stack. So it's not a problem. <laughs> they go to the processor system stack. Uh, what goes to the return stack is the loop indexes, of course, and that's, but the return stack has never been a problem. Okay. Well,